we'll start out there in James chapter 3 this evening, talking about the subject of lying and the power that it has. And we'll look at a few different things this evening, but we look at lies and we look at their power and we look at the things that they're able to do, and very often we like to make excuses for lies. We tell lies to keep ourselves out of trouble. Tell lies to make ourselves feel good. Tell lies to spare others' feelings or to stop problems from arising. And the issue with lies and the power that they hold is how long they can last, how powerful they are, how destructive they are. And God's Word talks about that at length. And we're starting out there in James chapter 3, looking first and foremost at lies and the ease in which they spread. James chapter 3, beginning there, verse 5, you can pick up there with me if you will. Even so the tongue is a little member, it boasts of great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. James is one of the chapters in James chapter 3 that likes to talk about lying and the power of tongues to a great extent. We'll be turning back to these passages a number of times throughout this lesson. But there in James chapter 3 and verse 5, he talks about how powerful, how destructive, and how quickly lies tend to spread. More often than not, if you give someone a truthful answer, you tell someone the truth, it doesn't tend to go very far. It's not enticing. It's not something that's usually enjoyable to spread around and keep telling people. But you tell someone a lie, whether building yourself up or tearing somebody else down or spreading rumors or spreading gossip, then, hey, that's all of a sudden something that I want to go and tell somebody else. Can you believe I heard this? Can you believe that someone said this? And that's enticing. And they go, hey, that's great. Now I'm going to go tell somebody else. And lies just tend to spread like a small forest fire. It doesn't take much to start one. We see it just about every summer, both in California and Arizona and Australia, all around the world today. It doesn't take much. But just a cigarette butt that wasn't put out and it was thrown carelessly somewhere a campfire that got out of hand, something little just can so quickly cause tons of damage. It can cost people their lives. It can destroy property. James likens it very much that here is how easy it is for lies often to spread and the consequences stick around for a long time. James chapter 3, continuing there in verse 6, the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. And the tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. Here's something that James talks about in one of the other translations. ESV translates it. It is a fire, it is a course of nature, and it sets the life on fire. The idea is it can last your whole lifetime. It can linger around. If you have to tell one lie to make yourself look good or to keep yourself out of trouble, and that subject keeps coming up. You have to keep up the lie. If you make it grander and grander every time, you've got to keep that lie up and you've got to keep adding on to it. If other people than the original one you first lied to start hearing about it and keep asking questions, you've got to keep that lie going. And then when it's found out that, hey, we've heard this story or you've told us this, that goes back 20 years and it gets found out later. Wait a minute, you've been telling that story all these years and it's not truthful? You've been giving us an answer for something that this is what happened. One of the big ones that my dad told my grandmother a long time ago that he liked to tell. He and his brother were out and they had a, one of 22, it was a, some kind of rifle cartridge, I forget which one it was, probably a 30 6 or something else. They had a rifle cartridge and his brother, Bo, had it between a pair of big pliers and was just sitting there and whacking on it with a hammer. Dad is standing in front of him, right where the bullet is pointing, if it goes off, against a tree. Bo whacks it a couple times and goes, you know, George, it might be a good idea to get out of the way because in case this thing goes off, it's aiming right where you are. Dad steps out of the way, whack, whack, boom. Bo gets the inside of his legs all torn to pieces because the shrapnel goes all over his legs. And the bullet goes right around the stomach of where Dad was standing in the tree just a few seconds beforehand. The story they told my grandmother then 
And my grandmother didn't find out until a few years ago when Dad was retelling this story and then realized, oh, Grandma's sitting here now. She came out and said, boys, are you all right? You need to come back by the house. And I think I heard gunshots going off. And Dad said, Bo, shut up. You can't lie to save your life. And said, yeah, Grandma, we came back by the house. We think someone was killing hogs next door. Grandma heard that a couple of years ago and said, I don't want to hear any more. I don't want to hear any other stories that you have to tell and the things that you have that you lied and you covered up. I don't want to hear any more. Spare my heart. We laugh about it. We joke about that in the family. We t still tell that story. And it was told at her funeral because of one of those that she very frequently keeps going back to. And I don't even want to know all the things my boys got up to, all the trouble they caused and everything they did. I hear about all the things that they got to in college and everything else that they did just causing chaos and playing pranks. And I don't want to hear it. That's the funny side of it that we can talk about. But she heard some things like that and some other family things I won't repeat of some lies that my brothers and my sisters and my aunts and uncles and different ones came around and told years later and it hurt them for a long time. We can laugh about the bullet and be thankful no one got hurt. We can joke about that now, but there were some other things that they lied to their parents and lied to their grandparents and it came out later and ooh. Yeah, that hurt them and they didn't want to hear that. The fact of the matter is, this has been a problem since the very beginning of creation. You go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. And no, while Adam and Eve, some have argued, did not technically lie here, I'll say no, they did. You read Genesis chapter 3, beginning there in verse 4. And the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows in the days you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and she ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Some have argued, I've even argued myself in some sermons, and kind of backtrack that now as I've read that a little bit more and studied that a little bit deeper. Some have argued that Satan didn't lie here. He only told the truth. And while it sounds like that at first, what was his intention? His intention was to deceive. No, he was right. You will not physically die here at this moment. Whether he knew that or not, I don't know. But his intention was to deceive them and get them to do the one thing God had not commanded. God had, I'm sorry, the one thing God had commanded them not to do. Even if everything sounds like the truth and we kind of twist it around a little bit and make it sound like it's 99% the truth, or no, that sounds about right. If the intention there is to deceive, the intention is like Satan oftentimes to cause harm. That was still a lie. And no, while we do not inherit Adam and Eve's sin, the consequences of that sin have still stuck around. It goes on a little bit further in Genesis chapter 3. There's still pain in childbirth. Man still has to toil by the sweat of his brow. We have to worry about sickness and plague and death, and all that is the consequences of just one little lie. Followed up by a couple of lies that we'll talk about here in just a few moments as well in Genesis chapter 3. But lies can live on even once the truth comes out. Like James said, it's a fire. It is hardly to be quenched. It is this great fire that causes great damage, and it can keep going on. And even if the truth is out there, the lie can very easily still end up being spread in spite of the truth. Oftentimes even fighting against the truth. One passage we will talk about a little bit more in our Wednesday night premillennialism study, and again, is talked about here. It's an issue that's still around today. It's a lie that was told back in Matthew chapter 28. In Matthew 28, beginning in verse 13, the Pharisees and Sadducees are gathered together. Jesus' body has disappeared. The guards have come and told them, and here's the lie that they told them to repeat. They told them, tell them, everyone, that his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and we will make you secure. So they took the money, they did as they were instructed, and this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Now, recognizing until this day means at the time of this writing, at the time the letter that Matthew wrote out was sent to the churches around. 
But the fact is, this is one of those cases that while he says until this day, it means even till today on June 13th in 2021. There are lies. There are whole religions that have this as a major foundation block. Premillennialism, Islam, Judaism, the modern day equivalent of that, all take a lot of this idea and say, no, Jesus, whether he was a prophet or he was the Messiah or whether he failed, some of them have gone back and said things around the area of, no, he wasn't resurrected, his body was stolen. Even among a lot of people in the world that are not religious, whether they're agnostic or they're atheist or whatever the case is, okay, historically, there's no denying a fact that there was a Jesus the Christ, there was a Jesus of Nazarene that did walk around, that did gain a following, that did have some people believing in him when it came to some kind of religious teaching. But the idea that his body was resurrected and he came back to life, no, that's not possible. Someone must have just come and stole the body and then started this rumor. Even among many in the world of scientific leaning or atheistic or agnostic leaning, this is something that's still being told today. It was still a problem, we know, by the time we get over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when Paul goes down through there and this rumor had come to the Corinthian brethren. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul goes on and tells them, listen, I declared to you the gospel. I preached it to you. I was a witness of Christ's resurrection, as were Cephas, as were the other apostles, as even at one time, there were 500 people that saw that Jesus was resurrected and can corroborate that among the dozens, if not hundreds, of other sightings in the short time in between when he was resurrected and when he ascended back into heaven. Brethren, you're taking a rumor, you're taking what is based in a lie, and it's even being taught by some of the other Jews, it's being taught by some other Christians. And it's the truth that has been twisted and you're believing it. I marvel at how quickly you've gone from here's the gospel that I've declared to you and you're believing this lie in spite of, we're not talking about biblical record you can go back and you can read for yourself. There are physical witnesses, some have already passed, but you can talk to eyewitnesses that saw Jesus walking upon this earth after his death. Now imagine how powerful that lie is and how scary a thought that is. That it's not my word and it's God's word versus against some scientist saying, well, resurrection from the dead isn't possible. We're talking about hundreds of eyewitnesses who saw it. And it's still being denied and the lie is still being believed. And this can last for generations. I know because lies like this are still going on. They're a wildfire that can spread from something so small. Things like the Pharisees saying, nope, Jesus' body was not in the tomb. It was stolen. It wasn't resurrected. It was stolen by some of his disciples. It and so many other lies can last so long. Part of the appealing of lies is maybe it seems like the easier alternative. Maybe we look at this idea, no, I'm going to get in trouble like Adam and Eve back in Genesis chapter 3. I know that I'm going to get in trouble, so rather than telling the truth, rather than owning up to my sin and breaking God's law or disobeying my parents or not doing what the boss at work told me, rather than just owning up to what I did or what I failed to do, let's cover it up with a lie. That just seems like the easier alternative. Well, let's look at how well it goes back in Genesis chapter 3, picking up there in verse 9. Again, one of those other cases that some have argued, well, Adam and Eve didn't really lie here. But again, their intention was to cover up, was to mislead, was to deceive, and was to displace blame. Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 9, that the Lord called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked and hid myself. <laughs> and God said, Who told you that you were naked there in verse 11? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded that you should not eat? But the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. Just kind of painting this picture of, well, it was just given to me, and I just blindly ate it, and it's not my fault. I didn't know what I was doing. I'm not going to own up to this. I didn't come to you when I found out about this. No, I went and hid. I didn't want you to find out. But okay, I guess now that you're confronting me here, I'll give you a little bit of the truth, but I'm not going to give you everything. I'm not really going to own up to it. It's still a lie. It goes on a little bit further in verse 13. And God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? 
But the woman answered and said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Again, doesn't want to own up to it, wants to misdirect, wants to deflect, wants to place the blame somewhere else. Sounds to me like how a little kid lies. Well, it's not really my fault. I didn't do it all. Someone else helped me. Someone else gave it to me. It's just trying to deflect and not give an answer and not own up to sin. Not own up to disobedience. And that seems easier. You know, while I haven't raised kids, I've helped take care of kids, and I've been around nieces and nephews and all kind of things, What's a whole lot easier to deal with when a kid owns up to, listen, I did this, I made a mistake, I did something bad, help me fix it, or the kid that's trying to deflect for 30 or 40 minutes and trying not to own up to it. What's easier to deal with? The kid that owned up to it, isn't it? What's easier to deal with in the workplace? A coworker that's lying and trying to deflect blame and blame everybody else, now we gotta drag everybody into this and have a conference and figure out, okay, What's going on? What's the truth? Or someone going to their boss and saying, nope, my fault. I messed up. I misread a chart. I put something together wrong. I misunderstood the job I was given, and I need help fixing it. The fix may take five minutes, if that, sometimes. But you try and drag on a lie because you're trying to deflect and you don't want to get in trouble, and you just kind of want things to be brushed away and it can drag on for hours or days or months. Problem happens in the church sometimes. Oh, I'll just kind of deflect and I'll just kind of avoid a problem. And I'll just not talk about it and I'll just lay out some lies and some deceit and just tell little things to not get in trouble. And it's caused church division in many places. The purpose in Matthew chapter 28, that lie we read just a few moments ago, when the Pharisees and Sadducees told those guards, listen, we'll take care of Pilate. We'll take care of the governor. Just go and spread this. Don't worry, the trouble won't come back on you. In fact, even kind of the opposite was told to them. If you tell the truth, you're going to be in bigger trouble. But if you go and spread this lie that the disciples came and stole his body, then we'll cover up for you and we'll make sure everything's okay. Sometimes that's the situation we find ourselves in. That we're being told, no, you need to lie so that we cover something up. And you'll be rewarded if you lie. Can you imagine what would have happened to those guards if the truth came out later? And they were some of the ones that, nope, they helped start this lie. What would have happened to them? In a kingdom like the Roman Empire around then, they probably would have been put to death. Now, if there had been a miraculous something going on, well, hey, wait a minute, maybe there's not death involved. Even the lie that we fell asleep at our posts would have gotten them in huge trouble if it wasn't for the fact that the Pharisees and Sadducees are saying, we'll take care of it, we'll make sure you don't get in trouble. Even that lie would have got them killed by most commanders. But they found and figured out, they no, the easiest way is just to do what our superiors tell us, and we'll spread this lie. In the long term, it's not easier. Sometimes we lie because we think it's easier just to make ourselves look good, to have a good story, to build ourselves up, to puff ourselves up. Also in Galatians 6 and verse 3, if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. 99% of the time, if you're just one to tell stories and take it from someone who did it when he was younger, if you're someone that just likes to tell stories to make themselves look good, most of the time people can see through it. Now I can be a little bit dramatic sometimes. And some of you heard me even Wednesday night when they said, how'd the surgery go? I don't know, they put 18-foot needles in my nose. <laughs> Obviously being sarcastic and being facetious there. But when you're telling lies and trying to puff yourself up and trying to be prideful and trying to make yourself look good, most of the time people can see through it. And if they can't see through it and it gets found out later, especially when it's usually little things, 
Well, why in the world would you lie about something like that? At the end, you just look stupid. You just tried to build yourself up in little ways and make yourself look better in little ways. And more often than not, little ways keep following a pattern and keep building up more and more and more. And there's more lies that you have to keep building on over and over and over again until ultimately you just look like a person that can't be trusted. It may seem easier in the moment, but all it really does is cause greater heartache and greater problems and greater, greater struggle, if not immediately, then it will down the line. Sometimes we tell lies because we want to hear and we want to repeat either what makes us feel good or what makes others feel good. Now, I'm not saying go to your grandmother and tell her, no, Grandma, that dress is ugly. There's a difference between saying something foolish and saying something hurtful that's not good for edification and lying. Old trick. Honey, is this white? This dress make me look fat? Don't lie like some have told us to do and say, yes, you look wonderful in it. But you need to have a relationship that you can be able to tell your spouse and tell your significant other, no, that clothing isn't flattering on you. Doesn't mean you don't look amazing, but that clothing doesn't look flattering on you. I don't like that color on you. I don't like that look on you. If you just build up a relationship that, okay, five years down the road, 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, man, my spouse used to wear this ugly dress. My grandmother, my grandfather got caught in one of those. My wife used to wear the ugliest dress. And I swore she wore it every other Sunday and it got back to grandma and everybody thought, well, we thought you already knew about it. We thought it was a family joke. And granddad was telling that story and he got in big trouble. Because he was trying to spare her feelings. He was trying to be nice. The intention was good, but ultimately it just ended up causing harm and it caused one of the biggest fights I ever saw them have. Because they didn't start out the relationship and they didn't work on the relationship early enough to go, listen, we need to be able to be open and honest with one another and we need to be able to talk this out and not just lie bold face to one another. When it comes to the truth, it's even more dangerous. When it comes to God's word, it can become something that becomes deadly. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 4, there in verse 3, a passage I quote very often here. But in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 3, Paul writes to Timothy, there are going to be those, I'm in 1 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4, there in verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears. They will heap up for themselves teachers. Sometimes we think it's easier to hear the lie than the truth. And so we go looking for people to lie to us. And sometimes we think, no, others are going to be happier if they hear the lie rather than the truth. And the truth of the matter is, at the end of it all, no, it's just destructive harmful when you let things go on when you allow lies to spread when you start to talk about these kind of things and it just causes more damage in the end than it does anything else one of the reasons it's so destructive is very often some of the most convincing lies play off of what are very often considered very common fears one of the reasons the lies in Matthew chapter 28 was so convincing the disciples came and stole his body away was that was one of the fears before they even put Jesus in a tomb. They put an armed guard at his tomb. That was not a normal thing to do. We do not normally put armed guards at people's tombs. That's kind of pointless. This wasn't even one of those societies that buried tons of riches with their dead bodies. It's a body wrapped up in cloth and maybe some spices and things and oils and things if you're very well off as part of a burial rite, but it's not an Egyptian tomb where they're buried with tons of wealth. 
It's a cave in the side of a mountain with one person's body, if you're rich, or multiple bodies in there that are rotting and decaying. You don't put an armed guard at something like that. But the reason they did in Matthew chapter 27 is there was a fear that his disciples are going to come around and there was already discussion of him rising three days later. Oh, there's already this discussion of him rising three days later. We better make sure that there's an armed guard there at the tomb so that we can really kind of put this whole Jesus person to rest. Let's make sure that his body is still there three days later. Let's keep an armed guard there at the tomb. Let's make sure no one comes and steals the body. There's a whole purpose of that armed guard. So that in the Pharisees' mind, the lie wouldn't get spread that he was resurrected from the dead. Because that's what they thought was going to be the lie that was going to get told. In fact, that was some of his own closest disciples and friends John chapter 20 and verse 15, when Mary comes to the tomb and the body's gone, she's looking around, Jesus isn't there, and a man comes up to her and she doesn't realize it's Jesus at first. And Jesus asks her, woman, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, Tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. One of his closest friends and disciples assumed his body isn't here. Someone must have stolen it. Not even recognizing that it was Jesus that was talking to her. Because in her mind, the reason the body isn't here is because it's been stolen. That's the easier conclusion to come to than that he's been resurrected from the dead. And that's how lies get to be as destructive as they are, is no, if a lie comes around and we're insecure or we're upset or we're worried about something, and just kind of like we talked about a little bit this morning, Satan's going to look for ways to play off our fears. To cause more division and more chaos and more harm to people. Back over in James chapter 3 there again. Pick up with me there again in verse 3. I'm sorry, again in verse 5. Even so, a tongue is a little member. It's a very small part of the body. It's not particularly strong. It's not particularly mighty. But it boasts a great many things. See how great a forest a little, little fire kindles. Verse 7. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and it has been tamed by mankind but no man can tame the tongue it is an unruly evil full of deadly poison now we'll talk about that passage here in just a few moments again a little bit in greater detail the tongue can be tamed james's point is not that it's impossible to tame the tongue there's no way to stop lies or anything else that's not what he's saying here so don't take that out of context Rather, he's describing, look at how deadly and how hard it is to tame the tongue. That it is unruly. And there's no way to tame other people's tongues. They have to make that decision for themselves. I can train a horse, even though it's not part of my own body, I can train it to respond to me. I can train a dog to listen to me and to my commands, even though it's not part of my body. I can bring it to a certain extent under subjection. Other people, other tongues, other damage that can be done by those can't really do much about that. They have to be the ones to bring it under subjection. Well, in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. You can't live this double-sided life here. That, no, I'm allowed to hurt people, I'm allowed to cause damage to people, but I'm going to keep saying what I want to. Ultimately, lies lure people away from the truth. That's Satan's purpose of the lie. Our intention may be to spare someone's feelings. It may be to puff ourselves up. It might be to help somebody out. It might be to keep ourselves out of trouble. But Satan's purpose with the temptation of that lie is to lure people away from the truth. Whether it's you or whether it's you and as many people as he can bring along with you as he can. That's what he wants out of it. 
1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly said that in latter times some will depart from the faith. They will give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared as with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Look at how deadly these are. Here are people that Paul says are going to fall for things even though they know the truth. But they're going up against individuals who have no care, who have no remorse, who have no guilt, whose consciences are so calloused that they're going to keep throwing lies out there. And it's going to catch people up in the fire. And it's going to lure some, Paul says, away from the truth. Back in our account in Proverbs chapter 6, we did that study a while back. We looked at Proverbs chapter 6. Turn back with me there if you will. We'll just read those passages very briefly again about how much God hates lying. And we look at Proverbs chapter 6, we begin there in verse 16, and it talks about the sixth thing, yes, the seven things that God hates. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift to run to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. Yes, they are separate things, but at the same time, one of the things those all seven things can be attributed to, we noticed back when we did that study I mentioned, is lying. Even some of the things we've talked about, the idea of a, a, a haughty look or a proud look, oftentimes we lie because of pride. The idea of causing innocent blood to be shed. We often lie and cause other innocent people to suffer. The idea that our heart devises wicked plans. The only reason our first instinct to be to lie or to continue to lie is because we sit there and dwell on wickedness. We dwell on lies. We dwell on ways to keep them going forward. We lie out of instinct, instinct because our feet are swift to run to evil. We can lie to cause chaos and so discord and cause problems and such is a false witness who speaks lies. One who dis shows discord among the brethren. Lying is one of the few things and one of the many things that can be attributed to each of those things that God hates. It's one of those integral parts of Satan's arsenal. And ultimately, the consequences of that is that your soul will be destroyed. Of the many sins listed in Revelation 21 and verse 8, one of the ones mentioned that will cause us to burn in a lake of fire and sulfur, the second death, is lying. Trying to shirk it off and pretend as if it's not something dangerous, it's just something innocent, it's just something to make something momentarily a little bit better, is one of the great deceptions as well from Satan. And so we need to be watchful of the lies, not only in our personal lives, but in the lies and the damage it can do to the church. Again, back in that passage I told you, we keep referring back to in James chapter 3. This is one of the things that James warned about. And this, these are who he's addressing, our other brethren. James chapter 3, there beginning in verse 10, out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, this ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth both fresh water and bitter from the same opening? James talks about how ridiculous it is, how dangerous it is. That some brethren think, no, I can lie on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, but no, on Wednesday and Sunday I can worship God when we come together with the brethren. Brethren, God's not going to accept it when we try to, in one breath, say something wonderful and praising to him and serving to him and then follow it up with a lie. That just causes damage and pain to his church and to his followers. Verse 6 of the same chapter in James chapter 3, the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, and the tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body. It sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. The damaging mark that is oftentimes left behind, especially among brethren who have perpetuated lies for a long time, for have taken things and kept them going, 
It's ruined churches' reputations in areas. It's ruined preachers' and families' whole lives. Specifically, even among Christians who have just kept it up because they felt like, nope, it was the easiest path to take. They kept it up because they weren't worried about destruction. And then it got out of hand very quickly. And it caused chaos and it caused damage that most of the time we don't intend. The fact is, lies reveal what's in our heart. Matthew 12 and verse 34, out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. If lies are one of your go-tos, and I'm speaking as one that has struggled with this, if lies are one of your first go-tos when you're in trouble, when you want to make yourself look good, when you want to talk about anything, if one of your first responses is to tell a lie rather than the truth, then we've got to examine ourselves and we've got to reflect there and we've got to work on changing that attitude. If our heart is focused on God's word, on his message, if that's what's being written on our hearts, if that's what's being stored up in our hearts, then we can train ourselves because the tongue is trainable. We can bring it under subjection so that the truth be our first response. But if we're training it for the lies to be the first response, it's just going to cause more damage. And ultimately, it can reveal what your real intentions are and what you're really like. Don't let something follow you for your entire life and leave regrets behind. The question is, would you rather have a truth or a lie? Romans chapter 1, verse 24 those people made their choice. Therefore God gave them up to uncleanliness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. Some people, unfortunately, do believe the deception that Satan puts out there. The lie is easier. The falsehood is more fun. You'll get something better out of it by following the lie rather than the truth. In real life, most of the time this is not true. And even if you are one of the few that's able to tell a lie and keep it going and benefit from that, spiritually the consequences will not change. There will be no there will only be great pain. And so we have to train ourselves to bring that tongue under subjection, to watch in the ways that we speak, to bring our heart and bring our tongue into such a way that we can speak the truth rather than the lie. James 3, beginning in verse 1, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man also able to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, that we may turn their whole bodies. Look also at ships, although they are so large, they are driven about by fierce winds, but they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. The language that he's talking about there, we sometimes get distracted by the time we get down to verse 8. The point of this letter, the point of the things that he's writing here, is it can be brought under subjection. But it does take training and it does take work. Back a few pages towards the beginning of the letter in James chapter 1 there in verse 19. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, but slow to speak. Slow to wrath. Be watchful, James is saying, of the things that you say so that you don't speak something out of haste and allow a lie to come out. That has to take self-reflection and it has to be watchful on yourself. We laugh at some of the things my father told and the stories that he did towards my grandmother. And she spent her time saying, I don't want to hear some of it. And some of it was meant in jest and some of it was meant because it hurt. One of the lies I told my father 
and I never did correct before he died. Was well, something I told to him because I didn't want to scare him. I had a big Ford excursion, and I had to go to work during an ice storm one day. And I drove out between an intersection of highway on my way to work, and I got stuck on a pack of black ice. I had plenty of time to turn. I was there trying to spin and get loose for a good 30, 40 seconds until a semi came and clipped me in the side and put a huge dent in the side of the vehicle. I'm lucky I was alive and I was frazzled. But I pretended as if nothing was wrong for a couple days until Dad one day saw it getting out of his work truck and saw it on the side of the vehicle. You know what I told him? I don't know how it got there. I wonder if a vehicle hit it in the Walmart parking lot or if I wonder if a cart or something hit it. I did it because I didn't want to scare my parents that I nearly died on the highway because the semi couldn't stop because I was stuck on a pack of black ice and I didn't want to terrify them. I had the best of intentions, but it was still a sin. I've corrected that with my mother. I've corrected it with others that, that I know of. That story had been told to because that dent was very noticeable on the vehicle. It wasn't even that I did anything wrong that got the dent in it. I hit a patch of black ice. There was nothing I could do. Thankful to God that I was alive. But I didn't want to terrify even with the best of intentions, even if trying to help people, even if trying to spare worry and bad feelings, the fact is it's still a sin. And we have to bring ourselves under subjection and we have to watch. Okay, why was that my first instinct? Why is that our first instinct sometimes to tell the lie rather than the truth? you got to sometimes spend some time answering and asking yourself some really hard questions. But the tongue can be tamed. We can bring ourselves under subjection. We can follow Christ. And I promise you, as someone who's had some real trouble, especially in my youth, with lying, it's far easier to tell the truth. Your work in the church will be so much more effective. Your family will be far happier. Because the power, the destruction, <coughs> the ease in which lies spread, nothing good comes out of it. But the truth is powerful enough to set you and I free. If you're interested in that freedom and that forgiveness this evening in order to become a Christian and you are not one, the water's ready. Confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Have your sins washed this evening. You will be forgiven and you will be added to his church. If you're here this evening and you're struggling with sin, whether it be lies or something else, just like lying, any sin is destructive and it will separate you from God. Don't let another day go before you fix it. Especially if it's between you and brethren or family members or loved ones. Don't make my mistake and not correct it today and tomorrow they may be gone. But first and foremost, most importantly, correct it between you and God. We're not promised another day. But you can correct it today, and you can make your life right. And God will happily forgive you and accept you back. If it's something that's done of a public nature that needs to be brought forward before the church and confessed of, we'll be happy to help you and pray for you. Whatever the case may be, if you need to take the opportunity, please do so now. As together we stand and sing the song that's been selected.